The Native American communities of the past displayed a remarkable ingenuity in their culinary practices, demonstrating a deep understanding of and reverence for the natural world. Their meals served not only as sustenance, but also as integral components of ceremonial life. These Native American groups thrive primarily on essential foods such as corn, beans, and squash. Whenever they were obtainable, they complemented these staples with meats, fruits, assorted vegetables, as well as various roots and greens. Many of these foods were deliberately rich in fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, packed with essential nutrients to fortify them against the challenges of their environment. Food held a multifaceted role beyond mere sustenance. It served as a means of celebration and communal bonding. These culinary traditions brought people together, fostering strong social connections within the community. Remarkably, the foods that Native Americans consumed in the past continue to be an integral part of their culture and daily life, representing enduring traditions that have persisted for centuries. Before we proceed further, if you are new here, please subscribe our channel, American Old West Tales, and share it with your friends. Your support means the world to us. Encidigoi, Navajo Kneel Down Bread. Navajo Kneel Down Bread, which they called Encidigoi in their tongue, got its moniker from its appearance after being cooked up. This bread was crafted from corn, a Navajo dietary staple. They take ground corn, wrap it up snug in corn husks, and then either boil or bake it. The way those husks were tucked in or folded gave the whole thing the look of a person on bended knee. Once cooked, kneel down bread came out tender on the inside, often with a crispy outer layer. On occasion, it was presented to medicine men as payment for their services or to seek their blessings. Elders of the tribe were also honored with this special bread. Some folks might call it a Navajo tamale, but not everyone agreed on that name, Pashofa, Chickasaw corn and pork. Pashofa, a hearty blend of pork, corn, and water, was a dish that demanded hours of dedicated preparation. Pashofa also took the form of a soup and required cooking in substantial quantities because it was meant to unite the Chickasaw community. To whip up some Pashofa, they'd start by cracking the corn and tossing it into a pot of boiling water. Hours upon hours of diligent stirring allowed the corn to soften up, and when it was halfway done, chunks of pork joined the mix. Keeping that corn from sticking to the pot was paramount. And for that, they had specialized paddles handed down through the generations. These paddles, crafted from hickory or oak, were cherished tools used to stir the pots of Pashofa. Atu, Navajo Mutton Stew. In the lingo of the old days, Atu served as a general term for stews, soups, and mushes, oftentimes featuring game meat like rabbit. These concoctions blended in vegetables like celery, onion, and wild spinach, along with a mix of squash, corn, and taters. As the Native American tribes shifted from hunting to raising critters, meat from goats, cows, and sheep found its way into the Atu. When rustling up some mutton Atu, they'd start by giving that meat a good saute before tossing it into a pot of boiling water. Once the veggies joined the party, they'd let it all simmer a spell, then toss in some seasoning and a dash more water. Another round of cooking followed, and when it was time to serve, it was often paired with a hunk of bread or a tortilla for good measure. Da Dinilgaj, Navajo Fry Bread. Among the Navajo folks, fry bread was a common sight and had many uses. It was a simple concoction made from flour, milk, water, and shortening, forming an unleavened dough that was fried up in a skillet. Once it sizzled to a golden hue on both sides, they'd load it up with cheese, tomatoes, beans, or veggies. In many ways, this Navajo fry bread served up like that was a dead ringer for a good old taco. Fry bread also made an appearance alongside a two, them soups and stews. But sometimes folks would drizzle it with honey for a touch of sweetness. When Native Americans were corralled onto less than ideal lands on reservations, they had to rely more and more on rations doled out by Uncle Sam. Fry bread was one of the few vittles they could whip up using the lard, flour, and other supplies that came their way. Wasna, Lakota Dried Meats and Fruits. The Lakota folks called it Wasna, which roughly meant anything all mixed up. And to them, Sioux people, including the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota, 
it was a true lifeline, both nutritionally and spiritually. The legend had it that Wasna, also known as Pemmican, was the very lifeblood of the Sioux, a blend of dried meats, fruit, and fat. On account of its hefty calorie count, Wasna was worth its weight in gold, since it could keep warriors and hunters going for days on end. Crafting Wasna involved taking dried meat, often from beef, buffalo, or venison, and mixing it up with dried berries. Then, it got a generous coating of melted kidney fat or lard, and was eaten either with a spoon or right by hand. In the past, they'd stuff Wasna into pouches or bladders, but nowadays it's more commonly shaped into balls, patties, or squares for easy transport. We wish. Miwok acorn mush, folks. Round these parts, especially the Luis Senos in California, knew a thing or two about We Wish, and the Miwok folks up north were no strangers to it either. You see, We Wish was a stew whipped up from acorns, them mighty nutritious nuts that dropped from the oak trees. Up in Northern California, there were over 10 kinds of acorns, each adding its own flavor to the mix, and they packed in essential fats, carbs, vitamins, and protein. First order of business for making Wywish was gathering up them acorns come autumn. Once you had a good haul, them acorns were dried out and tucked away till they were needed. When it was time to whip up some Waywish, you'd crack open them acorns and take out the meat from them shells. You'd peel off the skin, grind them acorn kernels into flour, and mix that flour with water. Then, you'd do a leaching to get rid of the bitterness. And finally, you'd cook it all into a mush, bread, or stew. Now, when Charles F. Saunders took a trip out west in the early 20th century, he had himself some wee-wish and had this to say about the flavor. It ain't the most exciting taste kind of plain, but there's a hint of nuttiness that grows on you, even to some of them white taste buds. Judging by my own experience, I'd say it's about as good as your average breakfast food mush. Most white folks reckon you gotta have cream, sugar, and a pinch of salt to go with it. Them acorns weren't just a Miwok thing either. Folks from other tribes like the Apache and Yavapai knew a good acorn when they tasted one too. Tiswin, Apache corn brew. Based on the diggings of them archaeologists, it seems that folks from the Pueblo tribes down yonder in the American Southwest were partaking in some corn-based brewing, about 800 years back. Now, Tiswin, on the other hand, is more often linked to the Apache folks. A whole different bunch who had themselves some mighty close encounters with them Pueblo folks. Dateste, bless her heart, said that the brewing process took a heap of time when you didn't have no yeast. They'd sometimes toss in weeds and roots, and they'd be grinding away at it more than once. Another type of tiswin was made with the mezcal plant, or other prickly cacti, and that took days, if not weeks, of crushing, boiling, and letting it ferment. Now, some folks in Apache society, and there's a pile of literature chatting about it, would go on about them Tiswin drunks. But the Apache folks themselves, they don't put much stock in that. You see, Tiswin didn't pack much of a punch in the alcohol department. To a fellow like Victor Randall of the Mescalero Apache, he'd say, you gotta put back quite a few cups of Tiswin before it even starts to get you feeling tipsy. Peaky. Hopi cornmeal bread. Peaky, a slender cornbread crafted by the Hopi, bore a likeness to Navajo paper bread. They'd whip up peaky using blue or red corn, mixing it with ash and water. Although the dough was usually thick, the peaky itself turned out real fine and thin. The gals would grab handfuls of that peaky dough and spread it right over a sizzling hot flat stone. Once it was all cooked up, you could fold the peaky, lay it out flat, or roll it up and serve it alongside a whole range of other fixins. Sometimes, they'd leave it plain, while other times, They'd add some flavors and bright colors to spice things up a bit. Crafting peaky was a skill that the ladies honed over years of practice, and they'd have a special spot, a little room or a house, set aside just for whipping up that peaky. Kanuchi, Cherokee Hickory Nut Soup. The hickory tree held plenty of importance for Native Americans, what with its nuts used for cooking and medicine and all. You could crush hickory nuts and make them into a drink, but they could also be boiled and strained to make what they called hickory milk. One recipe that was downright common among Cherokee folks was kanuchi, which was a soup made from hickory nuts. When early autumn rolled around, 
The ladies would gather them fallen hickory nuts and let them dry out for a good spell. Afterward, they'd get the meat from them nuts, grind it down, and shape it into balls. Them balls would sit for a while before they got tossed into a pot of boiling water. Once they strained it to make sure there weren't any shell bits left, the Cherokee gals would add some hominy, and from time to time, a dash of sugar or honey. Last in the list is Wohapi, Dakota Berry Pudding. When it came to satisfying that sweet tooth, Wojapi sure hit the spot among Sioux folks, particularly the Dakota and Lakota, who made their homes down in South Dakota. They'd whip up Wojapi using choke cherries, root flour, and a sprinkle of sugar. They'd mix it all together, heat it up till it was bubbling, and thicken it up as needed. Wojapi could be served up like a pudding, but it also made a fine drizzle over some fry bread. Now, mind you, this weren't just some dessert. Wohapi was a bona fide part of their regular chow. They'd stash it away for special occasions and them ceremonial get-togethers. Them choke cherries, you see, were the real deal in Wohapi. And they weren't just tasty. They had some powerful medicine in them, too. Choke cherries popped up in Wazna, and they were highly prized for their healing properties. 